Hi, this is Dr. Kimberly Leonard, and you're listening to Incredible Life Creator Podcast. And I am also the author of the book, Visualizing Happiness in Every Area of Life. So if you want a step-by-step guide to creating an incredible life of your own, pick up this book. My guest today is Terry Moore. Terry Moore has over 30 years in the music industry. In the past, he has worked with Will Smith, Queen Latifah, MTV, MC Light, Milk, Billboard Magazine, and others. Welcome to the podcast, Terry. Hey, good morning. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Ah, so just so people can get to know you, tell us your story, how you started out and how you got into the music business. Okay, great. Well, you know, uh, first of all, I was born with cerebral palsy. Uh, when I was born, the doctors actually advised my parents that I wasn't going to amount to anything that they had to be put into a nursing home. And this is like the mid 60s, 1960s. So they really didn't have an uh, idea of uh, people with disabilities. So thankfully, my parents didn't listen to me and they gave me a lot of encouragement. And um, I sort of hit a, a, a crossroad in my life around maybe the mid 80s, 1984, 85, when I was um, watching uh, the American Music Awards and Prince was performing. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, he looks like he's having a lot of fun and he's getting paid to do it. I, you know what? I want to be in the music industry. I want to do something that I can have a lot of fun doing and get paid to do it. And that was really my first uh, decision to move forward in the music industry. So I literally sat down with a bunch of albums and the yellow pages and the white pages. And I started making calls, asking people if I could come in and work for free. And of course, 98.8% said, no, we don't need your help. And but 1% uh, guy by the name of uh, Rob said, come on into the studio and I'll interview you because they needed an office manager for the weekend. And uh, I did get the job at the office manager working from free from 12 in the afternoon, 12, yeah, 12 in the afternoon, 12 at night. But it gave me the opportunity to work with Yoko Ono, uh, Harry Belafonte's son, uh, as well as a couple other people like Roy Ayers. And then I moved on from uh, working at the recording studio to working with Billboard magazine. And I worked with Billboard for about a year. My job was to call the radio stations and record stores and get their list. And that's how we sort of compiled the vote for Billboard, the top 10, 100 and everything uh, every week. And that gave me the opportunity to meet the BGs and Stacey Ladder saw in Moore's Day, and that was great. And then I moved on to a, a record label out of Brooklyn called First Priority Music, which was the independent hip-hop label that was distributed by uh, Atlantic Records. And uh, I came in as a publicist with no experience of what a publicist does. So my, uh, my boss, and, and still to this day, my best friend, Nat Robinson, said one day, you're now a publicist. And I was like, a publicist? What is that? And he said, you gotta, you got to learn it. And so uh, that opened up the door for me to work with a lot of people such as MC Light and Milk and Giz from Audio 2. And, but it also gave me the chance to really work with and network with people like Queen Latifah and Will Smith when he was a Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince and a bunch of other people. And uh, fast forward to 2022, uh, I still do a little bit of the music industry. I'm now involved with a company called Legal Show because not only do... Uh, the average person needs some type of legal access. Being able to have a, a, an attorney on retainer for affordable price, but a lot of artists also need to have uh, access to a law firm with an affordable retainer. And that's one of the reasons why I got involved with that. And then also because of my disability, I've gotten involved with public speaking over the last 15 years or so. Wow, that is quite a journey. Thank you. So. Um, I'm just curious, you know, you said that when you were born, you were born with this disability of cerebral palsy. Did you have other brothers and sisters growing actually, up? Actually, you know what? I was the only child, but my uh, neighborhood friends and some cousins became brothers and sisters in that sense. But yeah, I was an only child. Cool. And what, um, I'm just thinking about other parents who have a child that is born you know, with a disability, what kind of things did your parents do to you that you think that gave you that step up, that ability to do what you're doing now? 
it was a lot of uh, freedom to just be me. Um, they didn't coddle me and don't do that and, you know, watch it and be careful. In fact, uh, my father used to, you know, if I was walking with him and then, you know, walking behind him when I was, you know, six, seven years old, if I fell down, he would keep walking. And uh, he wouldn't run back and try to pick me up or anything because he knew I would eventually learn how to get up on my own. And so stuff like that definitely taught me for the long run, even to this day. Mm. Wow, that sounds like you had amazing parents. Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And then what things did you do for yourself to encourage yourself when you got felt defeated or you felt like things were harder than they should have been? You know, for a long time, up until probably uh, middle school and, and we, were, we stay in, in uh, the North Junior High, uh, up until junior high and middle school, I was actually a loner. I spent a lot of time home. I didn't really start making friends until junior high school, middle school area. But I did spend a lot of time reading. In fact, I could read a book in a day or two because I would literally like read books all the time. And I think that also shaped my world as far as being able to read uh, different experiences. And I was a autobiographer reader. So I read a lot of autobiographies. And and that really helps a lot as well, too. Mm -hmm. What are some books you would recommend people read? Like, this is a must read for anyone. You know, um, as I'm older now, I'm, I'm, I read a lot of um, a lot of motivational books. Uh, me having a music background, I would definitely say the two books, and I think I got them on my shelf. Uh, one of them is on the shelf. The other one is on the other one. But Sidney Poitier's biography is excellent as well as um, Quincy Jones' biography. Okay, what was the first one? Because I didn't hear it very well. Oh, Sidney Poitier. Okay. Yeah, yeah, his autobiography was good. And, and, and Arthur Ashe's book was also impactful because just reading about his journey as he was battling AIDS. So reading Arthur Ashe's book was pretty impactful as well. Yeah. Wow, amazing. And then, Tell me about the music industry. I mean, how was it meeting these people as a young man? I mean, who was like the first person you met and what was your reaction? The first celebrity that I actually met, uh, believe it or not, I wasn't actually in the industry. I was, I was probably about 10, 11 years old and I was at this uh, banquet dinner in New York City uh, that was honoring people with disability. I don't even know why I was there. I just know that I was there with my parents. And uh, Gerardo Rivera was in the audience. And uh, my father said, come on, let's meet Gerardo Rivera. And he actually took me to meet him and stuff. Uh, but in the music industry side, uh, goodness, from just, uh, I would say, MC Light, Queen Latifah, Puffy. Uh, I'm just trying to think of uh, Ice-T when he was uh, still performing before the whole law and order thing. Uh, it was really just like hanging out with friends. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, oh wow, this is like, see, it was, it was more so like when I, I was on tour, uh, you know, traveling by tour bus from city to city with a couple of groups that I was working with. And when we would do shows with like Queen Latifah and uh, Ice-T and uh, different artists, it was really like watching your friends on stage perform and sort of having that, that feel good proud moment like wow that's my sister Latifa mm -hmm. really doing her thing on stage and just being yeah super proud of, of watching people live their dreams so that was always cool that's cool what do you think gave you the most fulfillment out of um, being in the music industry I would say one of the moments I remember the uh, not so much the most but one of the highlights was being at the NBA all-star game in 1992 uh, Light was invited to come down to perform for what they call the uh, summer school jam, NBA NBA school jam, and they have a half, sort of like not a half time, but it's a when the the NBA game All Star game is on a Sunday. Normally, the NBA does they bring all the the, uh, the middle school kids in from the area, and they have a lot of artists come and perform for them the day before, and it's called Stay in School Jam. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, that was that was probably one of the highlights because I got a chance to see Michael Jordan and and hang out with a lot of the NBA players. Boys to Men performed at that show, so getting the chance to hang out with them and uh, Fondo Ribeiro, and so that was probably the, that was probably that weekend uh, was like okay, this yeah, this is kind of cool because I remember you know the NBA the NBA does the top notch, so they would give you a card. It was sort of like a hotel credit card. You can order food when you wanted to, go into the gift shop and go into the cafeteria, not the cafeteria, but the restaurant, and you use the card. It's sort of like a credit card. And then when you walk out of the hotel, you always had a limousine waiting for you. So I was like, okay, yeah, I, I can get used to this. This is pretty good. That is really, really cool. <laughs> really, really cool. And you know that that kind of life is really a dream for a lot of people. Yeah. You know, the thought that, you know, that you lived it is just amazing. What would you say to uh, young people as far as if they have a dream, how do they go for it? How do they get into it? Especially the ones like yours, where it seems like that was almost impossible to get into, but you got into it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's really just um, a couple of things I would say is to stay consistent. Uh, there's going to be days when you feel like this is not working and nobody's listening to me, but you have to stay consistent. Uh, I write everything down. I I have notebooks and I, I'm always visually planning by writing stuff down. And uh, you also have to really have so much of a strong belief in yourself that no matter what people tell you, I just, you know, when I got into the music industry, even the current industry that I'm in now with Legal Shield, um, when I got into the music industry, there was a few people that told me, hey, you know, it's one of the hardest industries to get into, uh, especially being disabled. And I just could not understand, comprehend, but there's thousands of people doing it right now. So why can't I do it? If, you know, if you told me in the music industry there was only 20 people actually being successful in the music industry, then I said, okay, this is the odds are against me. But I felt like the odds was in my favor because there were thousands of people already doing it, whether they were working at the record labels, working at recording studios, they were videographers or photographers or choreographers. I knew that there was a, a great community that was already doing it. And I was like, well, if they can do it, I, I can definitely do it. So that, that's that strong belief. So you just look for that place where you can kind of sneak in. I mean, you uh, volunteered to work for free. I think that's a good way to get into a lot of industries because, you know, when you go in and work for free, of course, um, you're giving your time free, but the person who takes you on is actually training you. So it's not exactly free to them, even though you're thinking, oh, I'm working for free, but, mm -hmm. you know, it takes a lot of time to actually train someone. So you found someone who is willing to take you on, train you as a young person. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think a lot of um, times we think, well, we, I need to be compensated for what I'm doing. But you don't think about the business owner's point of view where when they take on someone new, especially someone who has not been in the industry, they are putting a lot of their time and effort and thought into that person. So they're actually investing more in you than you realize. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when, when I when I offered to work for free, I just wanted, wanted to get into the industry, but I was willing to learn and say, you know, hey, I don't, don't pay me. Like, you know, I want to learn. And then uh, working, for, working for the recording studio every Sunday, gave me the opportunity to actually start looking for a paid job. So um, I used to call Billboard Magazine. And I used to just think to myself, you know, where do, where do I want to work? You know what would be kind of cool? I want to work for Billboard Magazine. That would be kind of cool. And so I would be laser focused on getting that job with Billboard Magazine. And I would call every week asking, hey, do you have anything? And a guy that I actually, uh, every week, Harry Michelle. He would say, no, Terry, we don't have anything, but give us a call next week. And I'd say, okay, next week I would call. And that went on for about six or seven months until finally um, he called me and said, hey, uh, somebody's going to be out sick today. Can you come in? 
And I came into Billboard that day, he told me what to do. I did great, which was fantastic. Uh, but that didn't mean I had a job until one time, about maybe a month later, he said, hey, we got an opening. Do you want to come in? And I worked at Billboard for about a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. So that persistence, can, like you said, consistency and persistence. Yes. yes, exactly. Absolutely. Yes. Beautiful. Now, would you play or sing or anything? I mean, you're talking about supporting other artists, but are you an artist? I am not. I am. I am a home artist. If there's if such a thing, because I I actually have. I don't know if uh, see it here, but I actually have my keyboard. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been teaching myself how to play the piano for the last two and a half years. So I'm watching a lot of YouTube videos on how to play certain songs, and uh, I've learned how to play uh, "Imagine" by John Lennon. Um, "Journey," "Open Arms." A couple of songs by Luther Vandross, so it's it's uh, it's more of a hobby. Mm -hmm. It's because I've always wanted to play, so this is with uh, me getting back to just playing, and it's been pretty cool. And, and that's so important to do something that just fills up your own soul, your own heart. Yes, yes, absolutely. I I was at a an event about a month ago, and they had a piece there. So for people that um, for people that play instruments, especially piano players. Uh, when we see a piano, we just want to go and play it, you know, if it's in the public or something. And so about a month ago, I actually saw a piano at this golf event that I was at. And I was like, oh, my goodness, I got to play, <laughs> you know, and uh, felt kind of good playing for the first time in public and getting a lot of uh, good responses. When I first started out and I would tell people, hey, you know, I could play the piano. They say, you know, play me song. And they, I play the song and they say, well, I don't know what that is. Then you're like, okay, maybe I'm not, but I've graduated <laughs> from, I don't know what that is to, oh, I know what that song is. So I, now I know I'm progressing. Uh, <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, wait a minute, you don't know what this is and you're trying to play it again. And they're like, no, it doesn't sound familiar like that. But now I'm at the point where people are like, hey, I know what that song is. And so it feels pretty good. <laughs> mm -hmm. So a lot of successful people, they have a morning routine or they have certain things they do every day to keep them consistent and to just keep them balanced, I guess. Do you have any of those that you would share with us? Yeah, um, I have a calendar. I'm not great at sticking to it all the time, but I do have a calendar where everything is blocked out time by time, um, especially in the morning time. Uh, I try to do some reading, doesn't always work, uh, try to do some meditation in the morning. I am real good at uh, giving myself self breaks during the afternoon. Uh, if I'm working too much, I may say, oh, you know what, I've been at this, this desk for about three, four hours. I need to get up and, and go watch a movie or something, just to step away. And so, and I'm good for taking naps, so I make sure that if I'm feeling sleepy, that I'll definitely go take a nap and then I'll come back and get some work done. Yeah. That is wonderful. And it's so important to do that. I actually had a day like that this week. Um, I got up and I went and did my uh, water uh, exercise with a group class. And after that, I played water volleyball. I came home, I was hungry, I ate lunch and I'm like, I'm tired. So I went to sleep for two hours. <laughs> well, I hadn't even done any work yet. Uh, that's okay. But you know, sometimes your body needs that. So I did my two yeah. hours of sleep and then I got up and I was fresh and I was able to be real productive. Where if I tried to push through that when I was tired, I probably wouldn't have gotten much done. But that two hours was actually perfect to get me ready to actually do work and be productive. Exactly. That was your way of recharging your battery because you know, I always say we think we're in control of our bodies, our bodies in control. And they'll let us know when it's time to stop. That, that is exactly right. We, we have yeah. one thing in our mind, but our bodies tell us something totally different. Exactly. Sometimes. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. And I wanted to ask you about your public speaking. Like, what do you speak on when you go and talk to people? Uh, I speak a lot about my disability, overcoming uh, some of the challenges that I've had. And I also talk a lot about the music industry and my career of how you know I got started and 
and just uh, the story of being persistent and and making making that happen. But those are the two areas that I really talk about: overcoming my disability to work in the music industry. Beautiful. And then you do the legal shield. So you're just multifaceted here. <laughs> So why do we need legal shield and what is it? Okay, great, great question. Uh, oftentimes when we think of needing an attorney is when we really have issues like, oh my goodness, I, I need an attorney for something major. But the wealthy people have known for a long time to always have an attorney on retainer because we experience minor things all the time, a traffic ticket. Um, for example, maybe you uh, have an issue with a, uh, a company. Let's say your cable company owes you money. They overcharge your bank account and they're giving you the runaround. Well, that's a legal issue. And most of the time we're so used to, let me speak to your, your supervisor and you're yelling and screaming at customer service. Well, the wealthy know they don't argue. They just pick up the phone and contact their law firm and say, I've got an issue. Mm -hmm. It could be something as simple as taking your clothes to the cleaner and they, the cleaners mess up your clothes. That is actually a legal issue. And um, maybe you're, you're getting ready to sign some contract. Well, having a law firm take a look at the contract first is definitely a legal issue. You want to make sure you're signing something right. There's a lot of people that are not in a wealthy category per se, 90% of people, they just try to handle it on their own. And that winds up getting them into more trouble because why would you literally, if you have a, um, a speeding ticket, and the ticket is $200, the fine is $200, but you're gonna pay an attorney $400 per hour to represent you on that speeding ticket. It just doesn't make sense. But with Legal Shield, what we're able to do is collect a buying power. So for example, me and all the members of Georgia, we paid a law firm anywhere from $29 a month all the way to 169. And the law firm in Georgia gets paid about $2 million per month so I am literally have a law firm on retainer for about $29. But if I get a speeding ticket, I don't have to worry about paying that hourly fee. I just call up the law firm and say, hey, listen, I've got a speeding ticket. And they'll actually go to court with me oh, to make sure that I don't get, amazing. yeah, to make sure. Because if mm -hmm. you get a speeding ticket and you don't go to court with an attorney, you actually wind up getting points on your license. Your insurance is going to go up anyway. But if you go to court with an attorney, you don't get any points on your license. Oh, I had no idea. That's <laughs> good to know. Hopefully yeah. I'm not speeding at all, but <laughs> right, right. So be, you know if it happens, right? Yeah, exactly. But you know, it could be anything from running a red light, any moving traffic violation. And going back to the contract side, um, the majority of people in the music industry have signed terrible contracts. So for example, um, I often bring up the example of the Jackson 5. Okay, so when they were on Motown, they were called the Jackson Five, and then they moved from Motown to CBS Records, and they called themselves the Jacksons. The reason they call themselves the Jacksons because Motown owns the name Jackson Five. Oh, so they had to change their name. They had to change their name because they didn't own their names. A lot of artists actually don't know own their names. The Sugar Hill Gang, who came out with Rapper's Delight had to go to court to fight for their names. So a lot of record labels and management companies own the, the names. And so just having that access to be able to pick up the phone and just say, you know what, I've got a question. I'm going to call the law firm and ask them. And I haven't worried about how much it's going to cost because I always say uh, Google is not a, an attorney. And a lot of people try to Google their legal advice on, on the internet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So would it be like an adding category? So if someone had a question about like family law or um, business law or whatever, is it any category? And how do you know when you call, you're calling the right attorney? <laughs> no, that's a great question. Absolutely great question. So we have different plans. So we have plans for family members uh, that have any legal questions uh, or any issues regarding any personal matters. But then we also have small business plans for people that work from home or people that have a, a small business and they may have a question about trademarks or copyrights or, you know, we also do LLCs. But the law firm that we use in Georgia 
is the large, one of the largest law firms in the state of Georgia. In fact, you're literally getting the same law firm that Coca-Cola uses for only $29 a month on a family plan and then $45 a month if you work from home. And uh, when you just call the law firm, basically say, hey, I've got a question about, uh, back yesterday, I'll tell you a, a quick story. My subdivision, um, you know how when you have a subdivision, they have the, the entrance with the, the, the name of the subdivision. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody a couple of days ago crashed into this, our subdivision oh. sign, knocked down the trees and tore the sign down. And so my question was like, well, who pays for that? Now, in my subdivision, we don't have an HOA. I did find out that the police did do a police report. And whoever drove the car with, you know, total, they wind up towing the car. So I was able to pick up the phone, contact the law firm and say, hey, I need to talk to an attorney about damages to our subdivision entrance. And they said, okay, great, we'll have somebody call you back. So what they'll do is have somebody from the law firm who specializes in that area, give you a call back. And they were able to answer my questions. And what's great about it is that you're not limited to one or two calls a month. You can literally call 30 days, 30 times a month. Uh, he answered my questions, and it could be a 10-minute conversation or a 45-minute conversation. Oh, that sounds like a wonderful service that you know yeah. anyone yeah. could use because things happen in life. We like to hope that everything's happy and sunny, but that's not the way life is most of the time. <laughs> that's true. And, you know, I've been doing it as a business for a couple of years, uh, and everybody has legal issues, and I get a lot of referrals because people will call me up. For example, I got a call from a young lady who's a member. She says, hey, my sister needs to sign up. I said, fine, no problem. My sister lives in Alabama, but her sister has some land in Oklahoma, and she wants to know what to do with the land in Oklahoma, so she wants to get on the phone. So when you sign up as a member, even though you live in Georgia, you actually have access to all of our law firms in every state, as well as in Canada. That is awesome. Yeah. So, um, Terry, if people wanted to uh, connect with you, how do they connect with you? Well, I always tell people the best way to reach me is to Google me. Just type in Terry Moore, Music Biz Coach, and uh, you'll see all my websites come up, uh, all my social media pages come up. I'm also on Instagram, Terry underscore Mora, as well as Facebook. So the best way to reach me is to definitely Google me and uh, follow me on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Instagram. Okay. And that's Terry, T-E-R-R-Y, and then more M-O-O-R-E-R. So just- Yes, exactly. Now there's a Terry Moore out there that's a, a, a Supreme Court judge, I believe, or a federal judge, so he'll also come up as well. So I'm like, <laughs> that's not me. You look for the music guy. So yeah. Wonderful. So just a personal question. Sure. What has given you the most happiness and fulfillment in your life at this point? Oh, wow. Oh, goodness. There's so many things. Um, I would say uh, I have a 24-year-old son who's also uh, in the music industry. He's a producer and he's got a couple of songs out. Uh, so it's kind of nice to see him following dad's footsteps and uh, uh you know, he's got a studio that he actually rents out studio time, which is kind of cool. So in addition to his regular nine to five, he's got his side thing going. So I'm very proud of him. And uh, I just purchased my home about two years ago. So uh, I'm, I'm in interior direct, direct, interior, interior decoration mode. <laughs> and I got the governor to say interior director. I'm like, no, that doesn't sound right. So I'm, I'm, I'm having a, a ball just designing and coming up with uh, color schemes and furniture and looking through magazines and watching YouTube videos. Like, oh, okay, I want to do the living room that way. And so I'm enjoying that journey as well. Yes, that does sound like a lot of fun. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today and for sharing your story. And we just really appreciate you. Thank you. It's an honor. I'm so happy to be a guest and I appreciate you. Yeah. So I have one last question before we finish. Sure. What is your best advice on living an incredible, amazing life? Oh, um, I do things in bullet points. So I'm going to do three quick bullet points. Uh, one is self-development. 
uh, read a lot of books about motivation, did a lot of YouTube videos about motivation, uh, because you'll hear stories from people that have been at the bottom and work their way up. One of my favorites is Eric Thomas, who's a motivational speaker. I love, I love watching Eric Thomas' videos. The second thing I would say is to plan it out. Um, things that I've written down years ago have, you know, have come to fruition. So, you know, constantly write it down and visualize it and say, this is what I want to do a year from now. And this is the type of business or type of job that I want and write it out. And then also stay focused. It's important to stay focused, even on those days when you don't want to stay focused. You know, there's times when I don't want to make a call or have a meeting, but I'm like, I got to do it. So stay focused. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Terry. And we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.